Hello again, everyone, and glad you've stopped by here as we bring down the month of September and the final week of summertime here at Gulfstream Park. Acacia Courtney, Jason Blewett, Gulfstream Weekly, as we, as we tape the show, Acacia, mm -hmm. Five full cards remain before we head on over to Gulfstream Park West. It's pretty crazy to see that summer is actually officially over. We uh, The calendar said that fall started, but I think for us here at Gulfstream Park, it doesn't really mean fall until we head over to Gulfstream Park West. But that'll happen next week, next Wednesday, uh, October 3rd. Feels the right. Fourth. For fourth? October 4th, Wednesday, will be the first day of Gulfstream Park West, but we will be racing here five days, as you said, Florida Sire Stakes on Saturday, September 30th, and we will also be racing that Sunday, October 1st. Well, we really end with the proverbial bang and mm -hmm. the exclamation point, as you said, with that third and final round of the Florida Sire Stakes coming up on Saturday, and I think they're trying to card 14 races, so even though there's only five, the magic number is five, there'll mm -hmm. be plenty of uh, GP racing to go around before we head eight miles inward or so over to GPW. Now, as far as what we're going to cover on the show, we'll talk a little Florida Sire Stakes <laughs> a bit later in the broadcast. We'll take a look back and see what two-year-olds did well here last week, but it's all about races of the week, and for that, this might be, and I say this with peace and love, mm -hmm. our first ever trip up to parks. They had back-to-back -back grade ones, so that's where we're starting out this Gulfstream Weekly, and of course, West Coast for Bob Baffert stole the show as as we pick up his powerful run at the top of the stretch. Certainly did. He was the number four. And if you remember, I was a little bit hesitant about West Coast after the Travers, wondering how legit he is. And with this kind of up and downs of the three-year-old season this year, I'm in the West Coast bandwagon now after this performance. He ran a huge race. Second was IRAP, who unfortunately did come out of the race uh, with a sesamoid fracture. We're happy to report, though, he did have surgery and come out well. Yeah, we're thinking of IRAP. That's the, uh, the one real bummer mm -hmm. looking back at that Pennsylvania Derby and certainly sending some thoughts, prayers, mm -hmm. and good vibes Absolutely. to IRAP. I know uh, Daily Racing Forum's done a great job post-Pennsylvania Derby covering the surgery that mm -hmm. IRAP wound up having I believe Monday up at the uh, New Bolton Center, the mm -hmm. same place and the same doctor that Barbaro had a few years ago. So get well soon, IRAP. We're thinking of you. But for Bob Baffert, it's pretty incredible. And I know he was a little non-committal after the mm -hmm. PA Derby about the BC Classic. But you've got to think, a lot can happen between now and the Breeders' Cup, but there's a good chance he'll have Arrogate collected and West Coast in the classic. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty good to be Bob Baffert right about now, I think, or any time of the year, but especially now with these strong contenders that he has, and I would think the top three-year-old of the time yep. with West Coast. And I'm uh, reading some quotes afterwards. Both he and jockey Mike Smith were saying that this is a horse that's really just starting to put things together and is only on an upward swing. Now, Bob Baffert, we've become accustomed to him shipping east and basically winning all the grade <laughs> ones on whatever day of racing he's competing in. Wasn't the case Saturday up at Parks as his Abel Tasman ran well but mm -hmm. was ultimately second best behind It Tis Well, trained by another Hall of Famer in Jerry Holland offer and Drayden Van Dyke was aboard this upsetting Philly. And looking at the trip that Abel Tasman had, Mike Smith really did credit that with her being beaten. She got off a little bit slow and then he said that she basically tried to run away with him and that's why they made that early move up the rail and then she was kind of left with too much to do whereas it is well on the outside. I thought she ran a huge race taking nothing away from her um, but she was in a much more comfortable position locked down in the middle of the number two. And looking at no songbird, Abel Tasman uh, uh, will be three-year-old mm -hmm. Philly champion, of course. I mean, she's just had a banner year. And uh, I, I've got to think she'll have a big chance against the likes of Stella mm -hmm. Wind and, and, and Vale Dory and Forever on Bridal. She's very good. I kind of <laughs> underestimated her after the Kentucky yeah. Oaks, and I, I was dead wrong. She is top class all the way. She really is, and she was kind of in the shadow of some of the other big horses, Unique Bella at the start of the year, but she's really proved herself time and time again, so really excited to see her facing some of those top quality fillies and mares. We really do have a really good stock in the girl division, so I li like the girl power there. Definitely always a fan of the girl power. Now, however, we go to the Colts and Geldings in a small field up at Belmont Park in Saturday. Saturday's Kelso. For a long time, this had been a Breeders' Cup mile prep. Mm -hmm. It is now a Breeders' Cup dirt mile prep because it's run on the main track. And uh, this had been a tumultuous 
couple of weeks, to say the least, for trainer Jorge Navarro as we look at Sharp Azteca and his big tour de force as a big favorite in the Kelso. I'm sure Jorge was very happy that this horse ran the way he did to take, well, some of the spotlight mm -hmm. and attention off of uh, Jorge. And what do you think of the effort here with Sharp Azteca? Oh, Sharp Azteca is a very high quality horse. There's no denying that. And I think the, the key thing is that he really did get a trip he wanted to. He got a little bit of pressure early on from Birdsong and Divining Rod. And I remember when he ran here um, in the Gulfstream Park handicap, Jorge Navarro told me before the race that he didn't, he's not the type of horse that he wants to get loose on the lead. He wants him to have some company and a little bit of pressure and kind of hold him mm -hmm. before he has that explosive late run. And that's exactly what he did. So I have to imagine they're happy with that heading forward. Yeah, Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile probably next for him. I think he got mm -hmm. a 112 buyer. Impressive. Kentucky bred son of Freud. One of the few yeah. Freuds, maybe the only Freud <laughs> son or daughter I've seen by that stallion who is not a New York bred. <laughs> and with that opening pick three down, saw some big efforts. We'll check out the local Gulfstream Park two-year-old scene and a lot more after this little breather on Gulfstream Park Weekly. At Express Bet, we celebrate the champions that make horse racing great. That's why we provide more ways to bet from more places than ever. We've built an entire family of brands to give players more of the rewards they deserve, give bettors the information they need to win, and provide a community for horse bettors. Because the best way to support the champions of horse racing is to champion horse racing. Express Bet. We are racing. Passion for horses and a commitment to breed champions is the foundation of Hardacre Farm. Founded in 1999 by Amy Tarrant, owner, breeder, and trainer, Hardacre Farm, now based in Ocala, continues its tradition of success. From the Breeders' Cup to Gulfstream Park, Hardacre Farm, from the breeding shed to the racetrack, in pursuit of producing the best. And we're back on this September getaway edition of Gulfstream Weekly. Keisha and Jason catching up with you from our paddock set studios. It's been a fun summer here mm -hmm. at Gulfstream. It's gone pretty quickly, I must say. How about a rundown with five cards remaining in the local trainer standings? How about the run Victor Barboza Jr. has been on? It's been pretty incredible. And uh, Ralph Nix and Antonio Sano, names that you are very used to seeing in that top five trainer standings. They're tied with second three behind Victor Barboza. And Jason, I'm sure you saw the same thing looking over the cards the next couple of days. Oh, it yeah. looks like the Barboza <laughs> barn has been several more chances to get some more wins opening up the floodgates yep. i think winning his first ever potential north american and uh, stateside training title is an accomplishment and a feat victor barboza jr wants quite bad and we'll look forward to hopefully seeing him win a few races over the final five programs at gulfstream park joe orsino however is our trainer up next as far as a first samurai two-year-old filly that he unleashed as a big favorite here last week in fact going back to wednesday's seventh race sammy sunshine's her name she was a big favorite and she had mm -hmm. no problem sitting outside of horses and this was her second career start and uh, we've seen this several times throughout the summer we, we've talked about this before really strong two-year-old program and some nice two-year-old performances throughout the summer meet at Gulfstream. and oftentimes it is the experience that maybe just gives them a little bit of an edge going pretty wide in the stretch she was able to do it really nicely in her second start and it seems Seems like Joe is very much in the rebuilding process. He's basically completing his first ever summer staying mm -hmm. in Florida and not shipping north to Monmouth Park and maybe a little Belmont and Saratoga thrown in. And I think Joe's operation, now that he has got kind of year-round roots here in South Florida is only going to expand and I would imagine that's a trainer that will pick up some more two-year-olds on some more outfits. A very good horseman mm -hmm. who's done a lot of good things throughout the years. A day later, it was uh, well, a short price to a big price with always a dreamer getting the maiden win and we've seen a number of good efforts out of a trainer Rory mm -hmm. Miller. He's got a number of two-year-olds that are pretty good. He does and he actually kicked off the summer with a horse that was, uh, I believe paid about $200 <laughs> to win in Uncle right. Runt, which none of us had. Always a dreamer. This was his first start with the barn. He'd come off a little bit of a layoff. He debuted with another trainer. And this horse, he, he just looked like a beast coming in in the afternoon. A little bit keyed up, but professional on the racetrack to get the win at 11 to 1. Definitely. And still a little bit mm -hmm. green on yep. that inside lead throughout the stretch. I think there's more to give mm -hmm. as Always a Dreamer continues to develop for an underrated trainer, Rory yeah. Miller, who just does a good job. He really does. And I remember speaking to him before the first 
first leg of the sire stakes, has a farm up in Ocala, breaks horses, works with them, very good with two-year-olds and even across the board and just a excellent on hands-on horseman. All right, so on a stroll there with uh, Always a Dreamer. Then we had Kathleen O'Connell in a rare form reversal <laughs> paying a very big price, 15 yes. to one with About a Dream, who was a, a two-year-old filly by Bodie Meister. And man, she was not your typical first out winner per se, maybe wiring a field mm -hmm. or tracking outside on the engine. She really had to uh, dig deep and come from way out of it. This was not an easy uh, an easy win for her by any means. And as you said, you're not used to seeing these connections at such a big price. Jesus Rios in the saddle. She broke from the rail. She was a first time starter by contrast of what I was just saying before when often we see experience. Furster got the money today at 15 to one. Yeah, she looked pretty good for a very good outfit who just places their, their first Yes. in the right spots. Kathleen runs horses in special weight company when she thinks they can hack it there, but she's not afraid to run them for a maiden mm -hmm. claiming tag, and that's a move that's worked a number of times over the last few weeks here in Florida. And then it was on a Sunday's card. Uh, we'll step up off the two-year-old scene here at GP and look at a very good Midwest-owned three-year-old mm -hmm. by the factor. His name is Croy, and although this was not his preferred surface, per se, in the off-the-turf bear's den, it didn't matter. He was really good. He was really very good this day, and it was a big performance from Zipping, who was probably the horse with the best dirt form in this race. It was originally scheduled for the turf, came off onto the dirt with the weather, and you could see the fractions. They went very quick. This was right before the track was upgraded to fast, but even still, this is not where Croy is most comfortable. He set an early pace. He was tenacious, and he held on gamely for this and it sounds like the connections and by the way he's a perfect three for three mm -hmm. since the addition of blinkers uh but it sounds like with those blinkers and for midwest uh, thoroughbreds that they want to potentially start croy in the grade one hollywood derby which is run right around thanksgiving out at del mar uh, a little after the breeders cup a few mm -hmm. weeks after during their uh, fall meet uh, they'll get a handle as to how good he is mm -hmm. because from what we've seen he's the, i think he's the best three-year-old currently based in south Florida. He certainly has been able to handle everything that's been thrown at him, and I think that's one of the biggest keys. You had him with the first-time blinker, setting that hot pace, getting the win in the stake the next time out in the Tortugas. He showed that he could rate a bit, showed another dimension, and then managed to handle the dirt as well. So he's been ultra consistent. Consistent and classy, much like the jockeys will look at after this final timeout on GP Weekly. It's down the stretch we go, and we'll have a little Florida Sire Stakes preview when we come back. And it's Acacia, Jason, back with you as we charge down to the finish line here on this late September edition of Gulfstream Weekly. And before we talk a little Florida sire stakes, let's look at, well, what's been happening lately here in the Gulfstream Park Jockey Colony. And a familiar name in the top spot, <laughs> but what about Amisa El Jaramillo yeah. making a race of this perhaps over the last week? He is breathing down his neck, and I think uh, you have to kind of look at the trainer standings, too, and say, well, Victor Barbosa, right? Emmy Sale Jaramillo no a lot on his horses, not to mention this guy has just been on fire. I believe that the last several Saturdays have been multiple win days for him, not to mention the days in between. And uh, yes, he's got a lot of live mounts, but just some really big rides from Jaramillo. And a lot of talent on mm -hmm. that list and a speedy get well to Miguel Vasquez yes. with the broken collarbone. And I believe he punctured or fractured three ribs. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're thinking of you, Miguel. He was riding in tip top yes. form. It's just uh, it's 
what they do, these guys. They are so tough and talented, and we'll look forward to uh, Gaffleone down to Luca battling here over the last uh, five days of racing before we head west to Gulfstream Park West. Now, moving on to uh, Sutash and the crew, the boys mm -hmm. in the $400,000 in reality at a mile and a 16th. We'll find it. We'll take a look back at Sutash as a firm win. I think this is a horse who may just relish the stretch out to two turns. I think so, too. And uh, Ralph Nix came in with a very strong hand in, in the two legs of the Florida Sire Stakes. He had capital S win the first one. Sutash on the outside in the yellow blinkers, the Goldmark homebred overtaking his stable mate. Um, very big performance from World of Trouble on the inside, too, for Kathleen, Kathleen O'Connell. I'll be interested to see if that horse ends up coming back. But Sutash looks to me a horse, you're absolutely right, as the distance increases he should get better. He's a cult by back talk, a homebred for Goldmark Farm, and he is talented and one that I think can just stay with that mm -hmm. grinding, sort of relentless, uh, galloping style of his, but World of Trouble, very good. You saw him green, actually mm -hmm. bumped into the inside rail. Will they run back at a mile and a 16th for 400,000? We will find out when that race is drawn, in addition to the entire Saturday card, Wednesday here at Gulfstream Park. Moving on to the Phillies, and maybe there's a little more parity in this Philly division. There's no clear cut like, mm -hmm. oh, I really think that Philly is the best standout in the bunch. Now, Starship Benita wound up as we look at her win in the Susan's Girl. She broke her mane in a stake, which was pretty cool. <laughs> yes, she did. And that's one of the, the key things about this Florida Sire Stakes is that it, it is quite a bit of money in these three legs. And it gives these Florida horsemen and these Florida bred two-year-olds a chance to really um, get a good win underneath their belts and make a, a good resume builder and a good chunk of change as well. So a nice win for Starship Bonita. Sometimes you just have to take a shot if you think you've got the horse on the inside was Go Astray, who did win the Desert Vixen as that early speed. We'll see how these two fare in the third leg. No question about it. Or can a horse like uh, Awesome Mass mm -hmm. finally get back? She had burned quite a bit of money in the opening two legs of the Florida Sire mm -hmm. Stakes and maybe she can uh, rebound and maybe she'll relish the stretch to a mile on the 16th. The one thing before the race is drawn that I have in my mind is that well, I don't want to back a short price, especially in the uh, in the my my girl division. I really don't. Yeah, this is it's going to be a tough one, and you're absolutely right. I think maybe the boys might be a little bit more clear cut mm -hmm. than the Phillies is. Certainly, it's nothing like last year when three rolls was just so dominant right. in the boys division. But on top of those two two-year-old stakes, we will have four other stakes on the card. Again, those will be drawn Wednesday. We'll have Mon the Monroe, the Mr. Steel, our dear Peggy, and the Armed Forces. And looking at some of the early entries, looks like we might have some good ship coming in as well. The moral of the story is everybody, including <laughs> you, get a good night's sleep before right. Saturday, before <laughs> this closing weekend. Plenty of racing to go around, and of course, you can keep it locked to our Gulfstream Park feed, both on your television and, of course, on your computer as well, and that'll do it. Let's enjoy this closing week, and we'll see everybody next time right here on the show. That's right. Enjoy, and good luck with all your bets.